But first to millionaires and the people responsible for this plant on the Hollyhill Industrial Estate overlooking Cork City, the creators of the Apple Personal Computer. By personal we mean low cost, simple to use and with applications as simple as this one, a greeting, applications in the business setting as well as the home. A computer small enough, cheap enough, versatile enough so that every home could have one. The term factory scarcely applies here. It's spotlessly clean, and but for the chatter of visitors on opening day, the operation is busy but very quiet. The assembly line has been going for some weeks now, and already the target of a thousand units in the first month has been beaten by three days. The government see this factory as important, an industrial weather vane pointing to Ireland's economic future, microtechnology. Hollyhill Industrial Estate can scarcely be compared to California's Silicon Valley, there is the feeling that Apple of Cork may become something of a Silicon Hill, creating employment in itself, but also perhaps showing that sophisticated industrial activity is an attractive proposition in Ireland. The story of Apple's success goes back only four years when this man, Steve Jobs, then 21 years old, with fellow inventor Steve Wozniak, designed their own computer, named Apple because Steve just happens to like fruit, and they were stuck for a name. To meet the demand, the enterprise had to be commercialized. Enter Mike Markula. He's the man on the left, a self-made millionaire at 30, bored with doing nothing and with cash to spare. The man on the right is Alec Rafter. He's Irish and he's the boss of Apple Computer of Cork. It's appropriate that Apple should be in Ireland because even before they started manufacture here, Ireland had already the highest density of Apple use in Europe. With Mike and Steve, I traced the steps that led Apple to set up manufacture in Cork. Well, we started off uh, building a computer because we couldn't afford to buy one. So what happened was all our friends decided that they wanted one too and we were spending all our time helping them construct one. So this was the initial market indication that there might just be a, a group of people that wanted what we wanted. But it became very obvious uh, within six to nine months after that that we were really on to something much more fundamental than just a small group of people's interest. And uh, we proceeded to plan on that assumption and it turned out to be true. What was the ingredient, though, in your particular computer that would make it different from the other models that were being offered to hobbyists at the time? We had the assumption very early on that, uh, that even the hobbyists would like to deal with a slightly more sophisticated computer and one in which they didn't have to spend their time putting together. And so we structured our whole approach for really the, uh, a much broader definition of the word hobbyist. And we found that there's a little hobbyist in all of us. The success of the whole Apple venture does depend on volume sales. Do you actually believe that every home is, within the short term, the next few years, going to have its own personal computer? Well, we base our, uh, our theory on the fact that we make personal computers that can be used uh, irrespective of location. And the home just happens to be one of the locations that the computers are used in. They're used quite extensively in education. As a matter of fact, in uh, Minnesota, one of the states in the United States, over 95% of the, uh, the students that graduate from high school have hands-on experience with an Apple. And we're seeing them used in many, many businesses. As a matter of fact, we use Apples here to uh, control the production flow and do the forecasting and things like that. So we foresee Apples being used in homes, but we also foresee them being used in businesses and education. And there's an Apple going up on the first space shuttle, as you may know, to control a biology experiment. Does it mean, though, that the people who are going to use these Apples uh, have to start learning how to handle computers, which to many people is a closed book at the moment. Does it mean that every housewife will ultimately be a programmer? Well, as you see from the apple, it weighs about 12 pounds, and one of the nice things about handling it is if you don't like what it's doing, you can throw it out the window. <laughs> There's a pleasant sound totaling a million pounds for Cork's economy this weekend. The Carling Country Music Festival has brought thousands of fans to Leaside and bands from throughout the country. It's in the pubs and hotels that the real group sessions involving the fans take place, away from the formal performances that cost £10 a ticket. This session with Country Pride was in the Metropole this afternoon, where the festival started out on a shoestring budget only a few years ago. Now the festival can attract top stars like Johnny Cash, price tag reckoned to be £100,000 for five shows. From Nashville, he brought honorary citizenship to brewery boss Tony Halpin, who picks up the tab for bringing stars like Billy Joe Spears, Jade Hurley, Australia's King of Country Rock, and Becky Hobbs. Johnny Cash, who said he'd kicked the drugs habit and had a very pleasant 15 months without drugs, wasn't giving much away about what he was earning from the five concerts. Um, I generally don't know 
and I generally don't talk about money because it's not really what I'm all about, but I generally don't know how much my fee was until the end of the tour when my manager turns over my the tour settlement. Uh, he knows what it costs to do a concert tour, and uh, I've been doing it 30 years. I've never had anybody ask for their money back. The container remained at Bally Edmonds today, alongside the home of 74-year-old Mrs. Mary Ellen O'Neill, onto whose property it had been put last Thursday. Her relative who put it there is one of the two men being questioned at the Bridewell in court. Mrs. O'Neill says she'd been told the container was something to do with engineering, and the first she knew of the kidnap connection was when the shooting occurred outside her home yesterday. At Middleton Garda Station, the van which the gang first attempted to hijack, in it were found files from the O'Grady home, bringing the first positive connection between the Middleton incidents and the kidnap. And at Union Quay Garda Station in Cork, the Renault in which the gang made their getaway from Middleton. It was hit by a burst of Uzi submachine gun fire from detectives chasing it as the gang fled towards Cork. Well, the back window was smashed and the shot narrowly missed the driver's head, And despite the close chase, the men managed to hijack a second car. It's not been explained how that happened, despite the pursuing Garda cars. In that car, a Datsun, they escaped, and it was later found in Mallow, where the gang took a third car belonging to John and Nula Hannan of La Valley. The Hannans and their two children were held overnight, and according to neighbours, the gang asked for a Bible before leaving. Garda forensic experts went to Mallow this morning to examine the abandoned Datsun which was later towed away for further investigation. For two weeks now, the claimed phenomenon has drawn crowds of eight or so thousand each evening to the grotto on the edge of the little village, after two local ladies saw what they took to be movement in the statue. And as the word spread, the crowds grew. Now a 24-hour vigil is kept up, and a local committee has had to be established to control the crowds which travel from all over the country every evening. Believers say that after 10 o'clock in the evening, the statue is seen to move in a human way from the waist up, moving its arms and head. Others see the face of Christ superimposed on the statue. It's said that about three quarters of those who go to the shrine see some apparent movement. Uh, on Friday evening, about four o'clock, I was here with my wife and daughter, and the Blessed Virgin's hands were three to four inches apart. They're separated this way now. We went home, we had our tea, we came back that evening, that night. And I'd say about 10 o'clock that night, the hens were back joined together, the way they are now today, that way. On um, Thursday night, I saw our lady sway forward until I thought that the statue would fall down. And then on Friday night, I saw our lady's face change to the face of our Lord. And while our cameraman thought he saw movement and tried to shoot it, his camera saw nothing. On videotape, the statue is immobile. Well, in regard to the phenomenon, if we call it that, uh, it's not possible to uh, give an extempore or off-the-cuff uh, approval or disapproval. Uh, for one thing, uh, the facts are not very clear. Uh, some people uh, describe a certain kind of movement of the statue. Uh, others tend to see uh, allege that uh, the face of Christ is superimposed on the statue. So that, uh, as I say, the facts are not uh, too clear. And then th there are people who don't see anything at all. After five weeks of utter sheer frustration, hardship and everything else, We've gone to everybody else. I believe now we must go to the ultimate. We must go to the Taoiseach. Val Ryan is one of a thousand people in the Douglas suburb of Cork who've been left without electricity for several weeks, all because ESB linesmen won't drive jeeps. The strikers maintain ESB management hasn't followed agreed dispute procedures, has changed the rules about driving, and took people off the payroll unfairly. But their union, the ATGWU, has so far refused to make the dispute official, though the strike committee says that will change this week because they've got backing from their national manual committee. 
but they wouldn't be interviewed. The residents without power are far more vocal. The people of this part of Cork City have suffered enough. They're finished with the platitudes. They're finished with the, we'll do this, we'll have to do that. We must talk to this, we must... They were talking. They went to Dublin, we were told last week, for the ultimate they were going to decide. They were to come back to have a ballot. As far as we were concerned, we were never informed where that ballot ever took place. All we were told was they weren't accepting the four proposals. Now we've been told that they've got to go to London to make it official. 1985, I ask you, and I ask the rest of the people, are we still in that situation where now where the people in London, faceless people are now going to tell the, the people of Douglas and the people of Cork City, because it's happening in other parts of this city, not only in Douglas, it's happening all over the city now. Are those people, faceless people in London, going to tell us now that they're going to decide whether the people of Cork are going to have light or they're going to be in the dark as they have been for the last five weeks? The arrival of 43 relatives tonight brought home forcefully in human terms the scale of the disaster. They arrived from London where they'd been waiting for several days, anxious to know if their people, husbands, wives and children were amongst the bodies found, but with no hope of seeing those bodies for some time yet. The relatives had come from Delhi, Bombay and Montreal, despite official discouragement about visiting Cork, and despite being so near, they'll still not be allowed to see the bodies, though they may be allowed to go to the hospital. They prayed for the dead inside the terminal building before emerging, and it was a sad scene as they were escorted to waiting buses provided by Air India and taken to hotels around the city and county. The Indian airline authorities have said their presence doesn't help the situation. The authorities don't want any mistakes in identification. So it means the relations and friends, Canadian Indians mostly, are going to have a long wait. The authorities prefer to depend on medical and other records than on visual identification. The relatives coming tonight brought to 50 the number who've arrived so far, and another 100 are due tomorrow. Amongst those tonight were members of the family of the flight crews, and believed to include also the captain's wife. Health Minister Barry Desmond also arrived in Cork this afternoon, with the Indian ambassador, Mr. Doshi. He went to Cork Regional Hospital, where he said he was pleased with the response of the Cork Emergency Services to the disaster. A final decision on the move was taken by the Cabinet Committee on Security and announced this evening by the Department of Justice. A department official confirmed that Spike Island would provide extra accommodation for offenders on a temporary basis. The Minister for Justice in a statement said the additional accommodation was needed to deal with the projected rise in the prison population, particularly as 290 people were now before the courts on charges associated with car thefts alone. He said no decision had been taken on the actual number who would ultimately be detained on Spike Island, but an official confirmed that they would be mostly those sentenced to a year and under for joyriding offences, although there would probably be other types of offenders as well. They would go from various centres, including Dublin, Limerick and Cork, and as soon as the naval service moved out in about a fortnight, the first prisoners would move in. Initially, there would be 30 to 50 prisoners on the island, but this would be increased as required. Arrangements would be made for serving prison officers to go to the island, and it was envisaged that 50 to 70 new officers would be recruited. A department official said the naval service had accommodated 190 personnel on the island, and he indicated that these facilities could be used to accommodate up to 200 prisoners. The General Secretary of the Prison Officers Association, Mr. P.J. McAvoy, said he welcomed what he called the decision of the Minister to accede to the request of the Association to provide additional accommodation to ease the crisis that existed in the... Cork is now showing the effects of the seven-week-old strike, though traders have managed to keep the worst effects at bay. There aren't huge piles of rotting rubbish in the main city street, but the rubbish bins have overflowed and the streets are now becoming littered. The strikers have turned on some business people who try to keep rubbish from accumulating outside their premises. One of their least understandable actions being the picketing of McDonald's and another restaurant because the fast food outlets try to keep their entrances free of litter. The strike is about the workers' claim for £20 a week extra in meal and travel allowances to give them parity with Dublin Corporation workers but it's a claim that, for Cork only at that level, has been turned down repeatedly by the Labour Court. 
So why is the ITGWU persisting? Well, first of all, I must point out that while we have been in and out of the Labour Court over the last eight years, approximately, uh, and while the claim has not been conceded, nonetheless, on a number of occasions in recent years, the Court has said specifically that a serious anomaly now exists which must be resolved on a national basis. So the court hasn't given a complete thumbs down to our claim at all. On the contrary, Tom, they have recognized that an anomaly exists, which means that a serious problem is there uh, and should be resolved by negotiation on a national basis. The problem is that while the court has recognized that at least, the reality is that the real people who matter, the government of the day, have not seen fit to allow the negotiators on their side to come up with a formula into the future to resolve the current problem as we now see it. But isn't the reality really the government can't afford to? Because what you're looking for, if given to each other local authority in the country, and many of them would claim it anyway, it costs millions of pounds the government just doesn't have. Well, there are two aspects to that. Uh, yes, eventually it would cost millions of pounds. Uh, but I think, first of all, if it's established that the principle of fair play and equality uh, should be applied to Cork as it is to Dublin. That's point one. There are more than 200 taxis in Cork and about half that number of hackney cars. The taxi men say their jobs are being endangered by the hackney cars, which they claim are breaking the law. Hackneys shouldn't pick up fares in the street, seek business at a taxi rank, or use two-way radios within six miles of the city's general post office. So today the taxi men drove through the city, to the city hall where a letter of protest was handed to Lord Mayor Dan Wallace, a Northside TD. At the same time, other officials of the association were protesting to the Minister for the Environment in Dublin. We are here today to highlight the problems that exist in the taxi trade in Cork and the large number of illegal operators that are out there in breach of the licence regulations, insurance regulations and the lot. We basically want the law enforced on these cowboy operators. Why do you say the problem is happening only in Cork? Well, there's legislation problems. Cork, I suppose, is a market leader, possibly in this market, but the law is there. It needs to be reinforced. I'm calling on Liam Kavanagh, the Minister for the Environment, to give the Gardaí the necessary legislation to enforce on these cowboys. And if he doesn't take action, what happens then? What do the taxi drivers do next? Well, if un unless we get the necessary action, we'll have to go away and decide a strategy. That possibly there's a number of avenues actually open to us. With taxi plates costing £17,000 each, there's a lot at stake and the taxi men were scathing in their posters about the opposition, which itself claims the public is giving its support because they provide a better service. The taxi drivers have been protesting for some time, and there's now what amounts almost to a war between both sides. The Hackney drivers have formed their own association with 125 members, but there are some prosecutions pending against them for alleged infringements of the law. Meanwhile, they're quite annoyed by today's demonstration. Well, anybody who's called a cowboy is bound to be upset, but you see there's a fair background attached to this uh, situation in Cox City at the moment. We've been operating those cars for the past three, three and a half years. Each of those cars is taxed, insured and licensed for the purpose of private hire. Now, we engage in private hire business and private hire business only. But these people in the taxi association in Cox City are beginning to feel the pinch because we are slowly but surely eating into their little cake. It's upsetting those people, obviously. We appreciate the fact that it is upsetting those people. But yet they're not going to solve the problem as far as I'm concerned, making these false accusations. Are you breaking the laws, they say? As far as we're concerned, we're taxed, insured, licensed for the purpose of which all cars are being used, and that's as far as I'm prepared to say with regard to that. Thousands of people turned out to cheer and congratulate the court team when they arrived by train in the city within the last hour. Then the team was driven on the back of a lorry through the main street of the city. A reception is now taking place on Patrick Street where members of the team and county board officials are speaking. County board chairman Con Murphy said Cork had won against all the predictions. Earlier today, the Cork and Galway sides came together in a Dublin hotel for the customary post-match lunch. The men who want to develop Fota are obviously wealthy. Their company, called Darvala, is headed by Lord Mayo, 
Lord Inchiquin, and international banker Paul Verdon Rowe, and they say they can put £80 million into the estate and create 245 permanent jobs. You can leave photos as you've got them at the moment. Now, it's going to cost a lot of money to restore it. It's going to cost a lot of money to run it. Now, let's have it so that uh, people can enjoy it and see it uh, properly restored. And at the same time, bring in people who can uh, spend a lot of money in this area. It's going to employ a lot of people, A, to build it, and B, to run it. And uh, do we want it just sitting there employing half a dozen people? This is what Darvala wants to do at Fota, creating an upmarket holiday village with an 18-hole golf course and a yachting marina, as well as a 100-bedroom hotel. To do that, they've taken an option on 331 acres of Fota Island in Cork Harbour, part of which will be purchased, other sections leased, and they've guaranteed to UCC the preservation of existing rights of public access. That hasn't satisfied the opposition, think, headed by I businessman and farmer Richard Woods be and UCC forward. academic Garrett Barden. They I'm don't sure. oppose all development at Fota, yeah, but say they are fighting this the one because it's in the wrong so, place. Uh, and on Tashko tells me that the level of interest in um, the sale of Fota is um, three or four times greater than that on the Kowloon Bridge. It's been the, the um, it's caused more uh, public excitement than any other issue that they're aware of, that they remember. They planted a symbolic tree in the grounds of the world famous arboretum to mark the start of their effort to raise two million pounds, reputed to be the sale price of Fota, though Darvala hasn't said how much it paid. Fota House was formerly owned privately, and public access was severely limited. UCC bought the 750-acre estate in 1975 for under half a million pounds, and there was opposition then to their purchase. They specifically wanted a farm for their dairy science faculty, but then opened the grounds to the public, and with the help of Dublin Zoo, created a wildlife park which is not involved in the sale. But now UCC is caught for cash and wants to sell at Fota. It was businessman Richard Woods who refurbished the house provided it with a valuable collection of paintings and now says he'll remove them if the sale to Darvala goes through, although the developers say they've guaranteed his position. Morning after the night before, and for some Jacko fans, perhaps somewhat cramped sleeping arrangements. The first concert passed off without any hitches or incidents. And from first light, the massive clear-up operation from yesterday's party was well underway with an army of corporation workers. This guy has reached every section of the population. Magnificent concert. Really well worth going to. Fantastic. It was unbelievable. One of the many homes evacuated in Cork and Kerry today after continuous rain for more than 24 hours caused rivers to burst their banks and flood onto the main roads. In places the water rose four inches in half an hour and it caused many thousands of pounds worth of damage. Problems were worst along the Lee and Blackwater Valleys and near Glenfesk in County Kerry. Some commercial premises were under several inches of water and closed down. And so did some schools releasing schoolchildren to make a wet way home. The water is now over a foot deep here in Ballamakira in the West Cork, Weltucht. It's the second time in a few weeks that bad gales, accompanied by very heavy rain, have hit the southwest of the country. This morning there's flooding throughout mid and west Cork and into parts of Kerry. Shopkeepers sandbagged their premises against the rising waters. The village have been flooded. This is the third time in about 10 days the village have been flooded and the shops are all flooded out. So how are the people of Ballamakira feeling about that? Oh, I would say very badly. A lot of their, their stuff in the shops are completely destroyed. 
a grocery shop, a draper shop, a butcher shop, and the whole lot are completely destroyed. So you can imagine, the local mill down there, I'm told, is the warehouse is there about an hour ago. And you can imagine all the loss that they have. The mill kept working despite the rising water. But elsewhere it was threatening the main road between Cork and Kerry. Here at Crookstown there were several feet of water on the road and just off the main road the village itself was quite impassable and cut off from traffic. The force of water sweeping along was enormous. Hundreds of acres of land are flooded in south, mid and north Cork and in parts of Kerry. Mallow Town has been threatened for the past few hours and farmers are worried about their livestock. And they've every reason to be, with rivers having burst their banks in many places. Rapidly rising water has caused plenty of problems, but some livestock showed athletic prowess. Conditions inside the prison were reported to be quiet but tense following last night's disturbance in the recreation area, during which the breakout was made. There are several prisoners serving sentences for serious crimes in the jail, but the department hasn't given details of the crimes committed by the escapees. Eight of them got over a 30-foot wall. The Department of Justice says none were under life sentence. Two suffered leg injuries and were amongst the three quickly recaptured, not too far from the prison, on the north side of the city. Prison officers picketing outside claim the two had broken legs. While the injured prisoners were taken to hospital, Gardy searched for the rest, the Department of Justice saying they were all local to the Cork area and would be quickly recaptured. That statement came after an earlier claim by the department that only four prisoners had broken out and that three had been recaptured. With a hundred guardy in duty inside the prison guarding about 260 prisoners, the prison officers on strike outside claim the department's different statements indicated confusion about just what had happened in the recreation area, which they maintain had been damaged. The school is in the grounds of the Presbyterian Church at Little William Street and has 74 pupils, ranging from junior infants to fifth class. For the unique school, a unique opening, performed by four pupils sharing the duty. Parents bring their children from a 20-mile radius for education which they wanted, without regard to religious persuasion or class distinction. There is now a waiting list of 164, even though class conditions may not be up to the level of the ultra-modern national schools elsewhere. The parents are heavily involved in the organization of the school and help the teachers with extracurricular activities, while working committees concern themselves with religious education on a very broad basis. But why set up a special school like this? Why not an ordinary national school? Basically, this school was set up to respond to a need expressed by parents for a more democratic approach in education and also um, to a school where all religions and none are equally respected. And as well as that, it's a primary school, it's non-fee paying. So children are exposed to all social and cultural backgrounds. And as well as that, um, it's a co-educational school and there are very few co-educational schools in Cork. The parents say the entire idea of this school is to develop the whole person so the individual child's needs and talents are all met. But if the parents are satisfied and the three teachers in the school are satisfied, what about the pupils? What do they think of this very special school? I like when um, we're up in the yard and when we're playing. Nineteen eighty five, a memorable first year for Lark by the Lee. A surprise appearance by U two established it as a leading rock music event for rising Irish talent. Bands hoping to emulate Ireland's biggest musical success story are now vying with each other to perform at this annual event. All of the bands in today's lineup hail from Cork. This is Burning Embers, already with four singles behind them. Other bands larking by the Sunny Lee included the Bell Sonic Sound and Princess Street. Some 20,000 people turned up for this grand finale of Cork Rock 89. Throughout the weekend, record executives and music critics packed Sir Henry's in Cork City with a view to signing up talented new bands. Unbelievable. What a great day. And Ireland won the Harlem match and Everton is fabulous. Lark by the Lee wouldn't have been complete without Terence, 2FM's top broadcaster and rock star in his own right. Remember, 
The increased presence of exploration support vessels on the Cork Keys in recent weeks gave rise to the expectation of a new gas find in the Celtic Sea, only 35 miles offshore and easily recoverable. Marathon had begun drilling on Block 4820, only eight miles to the north of their existing field at Kinsale Head, the country's only gas field and due to run out at the turn of the century. Disputing the prices they were getting for supplies from that field to board Gosh, Marathon stopped all drilling, but settled their disagreement with former Energy Minister Ray Burke and then resumed the drilling programme. The find on the first well drilled since hasn't surprised the industry. It was expected, but the size of the find was underestimated by speculative reports which put the initial flow at 13 million cubic feet a day. Marathon completed their testing yesterday and announced the results this afternoon a flow of more than double that predicted, 29 million cubic feet a day, and gas found at two levels. That's big for a first test. Drilling on that block has now been suspended, and the drilling rig, Western Pace out of the Fourth, will start on a new block, three and a half miles further to the northeast. That's to assess the extent of the field, and is normal procedure when trying to ascertain the commercial value. The find confirms what many people have believed, that there are still untapped riches in the Celtic Sea, and other companies have exploration licenses there on fields adjoining the section owned by Marathon. But the Marathon one is the most lucrative, and their find has been welcomed tonight by the Minister for Energy, Michael Smith. It's great, really. It uh, reinforces the government's policy of encouraging and facilitating more exploration. It endorses the Celtic Sea, uh, as an area for further exploration but above all it's a significant gas find only about eight miles from the existing uh, gas field in uh, Kinsale. Naturally when developed it will add to the security of gas and it's very valuable in terms of avoiding uh, the import ports of oil. It safeguards jobs in that area and enhances security of gas supply for the future in the country which is what we want to do. It's also, as you know, an indigenous, clean fuel and very friendly to the environment. And the most significant thing about Cork is this, that Cork is a celebration of people. And in that, it shares this same quality, the same wonderful quality, with all our Irish cities, with Dublin or Belfast or Galway or Limerick, and indeed with all the cities of Britain and Europe. Because the most beautiful thing about any city is that it is a celebration of the life of people. You see, a city is so distinctively made by men and women's hands. You make a city, and um, if there is something distinctive about Cork, every city has its persona, its personality. So I, I wouldn't say that there's a, a particular Cork thing. Uh, we have our own distinctive characteristics. I would say that the Cork person, first of all, is an extraordinarily vivacious person. Uh, vivacious in speech, they speak quickly, uh, they have a very quick wit, uh, vivacious in gesture. Uh, they have a very strong sense of identity with their city. They really love this place with its warts and all. But there has a tremendous. But I don't think that they have any s sense of superiority or distinctiveness. You know, they are part of Ireland, but a very uh, distinctive and colourful uh, and vivacious part of Ireland. They'll tell you all kinds of terrible things about the people of Cork that they're clannish, for one, preferring their own kind to strangers. And there's some truth in that. But when the barriers are lowered and they let you in, they'll take you over, expertly 
even graciously, and tell you terrible things about themselves. Cork people are an enigma. Beneath the thin veneer of sophisticated nonsense, there's warmth. They're countrified and even shy. But most of all, they're proud of their roots, proud of being Cork, born and bred. We all have our own uh, loyalties to our own place. I think uh, Cork is, um, because it's very much a maritime type place, and a lot of people seem to think it has a continental flavor about it. And I think that maybe that is probably what distinguishes it from our brethren in the east and in the north. It, it is rather like I've often found that in places like Devon and Cornwall, you get the same type of mentality, which I think is probably a European influence, rather more than a Norman or any of the other influences that may have been. Um, what is that mentality? What, what, how would you describe it? Is it insular? Is it sensitive? What is it? Uh, I suppose uh, uh, people outside I think sometimes call us uh, kind of a, uh, an insular type of person, that we're, we're a close-knit community, and uh, though I personally don't agree with this, but people from outside have sometimes said, you know, that we kind of stick together down here.